Welcome to the Reason Roundtable, your weekly libertarian podcast that worries more about the gas bags floating up out of Washington, D.C., man. I'm Matt Welch, joined per common law by Nick Gillespie, Peter Suderman, and Catherine Mangu Ward. Happy baseball season, everyone. Hey, Matt Welch. Howdy. Happy Monday. Yeah, that's right, Peter. So a lot has uh, transpired since the State of the Union speech last Tuesday, if you remember it at all. Um, <laughs> uh, for instance, Rihanna got pregnant, and apparently yeah. we've started uh, an intergalactic war. But there was a critical and very chaotic uh, three-minute passage of President Joe Biden's speech that carried over into the following days, into this week, likely next month, most of this year, and why not the presidential race in 2024 as well. Uh, it started off by the president stating, quite falsely, that Republicans want to take the economy hostage unless he agrees to their economic plans, which include making the Social Security and Medicare programs sunset. Uh, Republicans erupted into House of Commons style hollering in response. Biden then shot back that he'd be happy to give anyone copies of what he called the proposal. Uh, then a apparently Cruella DeVille dressed Marjorie Taylor Greene started shouting liar. Um, Biden said, oh, we all apparently agree that Social Security and Medicare cuts aren't going to be part of the debt ceiling negotiations. And then everybody rose to their feet in rapturous applause. And our idiot political commentariat gushed about how Biden had laid a masterful trap for Republicans. Kaboom. In truth, uh, House Majority Leader Kevin McCarthy, the Bakersfield Comet, had already agreed the week before <laughs> to keep entitlements out of the debt ceiling discussion. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell has been loudly rejecting any notion of sunsetting Social Security and Medicare since last March. And in fact, the author of the so-called proposal to do so, Senator Rick Scott from Florida, also said again last March that, quote, no one that I know of wants to sunset Medicare or Social Security, end quote. Scott's so-called blueprint, which Mitch McConnell vociferously rejected upon arrival last year, simply said as an aspirational goal, not some kind of retroactive rip it up, quote, all federal legislation sunsets in five years. If a law is worth keeping, Congress can pass it again, end quote. And of course, Joe Biden used to say stuff like that as Rick Scott was uh, cheekily uh, pointed out on Twitter. Yeah, I, I wouldn't uh, use the term cheekily with Rick Scott. That's yeah, the bald. Not, he doesn't even have lead. cheeks. He That's looks true. like Fire Marshal Bill from uh, <laughs> the old and Living Color comedy uh, sketch. Trying. There is uh, no doubt that uh, President Joseph Ryden Ride Bobinet <laughs> the second made um, very effective politics out of the whole stunt. But Peter, did he really save Social Security and Medicare last week? No. Yeah. No, he uh, didn't. Uh, you really? Why do you say that? What, what makes I heard you say he did, that? though, Peter. You may have heard wrong, Catherine. Maybe you were. <laughs> I don't know where you're getting your information from, <laughs> it's, but some of us. Peter, are you did on, some of us uh, read did you reports. find that that stash of quaaludes? <laughs> yeah, some something? of us I mean, read the reports produced on a regular basis by the Medicare and Social Security trustees and the Congressional Budget Office, and what those reports tell us is that in about ten or twelve years, depending on who you believe. Social Security is going to be insolvent, which means that benefits will automatically be cut by 20 to 25 percent across the board. So that means that if Joe Biden successfully prevents Republicans from touching Social Security, then all of the beneficiaries who at that point will lose about a quarter of their benefits immediately. Now, these are estimates. It might be a little bit more or a little bit less. But that's Joe Biden's plan so far as we know it right now. Now, he did say that he has a forthcoming plan that's going to extend the life of the trust fund for maybe another 20 years or so. But we haven't seen the numbers on that. And historically, those sorts of plans have been a little bit rife with what we might call bullshit, just like numbers <laughs> that don't. Uh, it's uh, the official term in Joe Biden's America is malarkey. Yeah. malarkey. With malarkey, yes, with numbers that don't add up and are, are kind of fake. 
So right now, that's Joe Biden's position is that we shouldn't do anything and we should wait a decade or so and then let Social Security cut itself by uh, 20 to 25 percent immediately, which would affect which would affect the people who are most vulnerable the hardest because social security goes to people who are quite well off as well as people who are uh, who are struggling uh peter before i uh, lateral to nick uh about a related issue uh, about all this can you give us any sense of the like uh like amount right so the, the 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 day happens we are insolvent day happens um how much money or how do you characterize the amount of money to uninsolvent it? Like what would, is there a, is there a dollar figure on it? Is there like a, a tax figure on it? Is there any way to sort of wrap our puny Matt Welch sized brains around this concept? So to understand this, it's helpful to understand how we pay for social security right now. And so I'm going to, I'm going to bracket this by saying, we don't actually pay for social security right now. We have a trust fund that is fake, but let's for a moment you just you just ignore that and assume that the trust fund is kind of real or at least real as an accounting fiction. And so the way we do this is that we have a, we have a payroll tax on the first hundred and forty seven thousand dollars of income that people. Uh, earn. It's actually one hundred and sixty thousand in twenty twenty three. And it's gone up since 2015 from like 200 uh, from one hundred. So, so some of us are still living in the past where it's twenty twenty two. And it's a better pass. Like I it's haven't, a better pass. I haven't it's seen a... the Super Bowl yet. So for me, so did twenty twenty three even really happen? We're not even in twenty twenty three. Uh, and so, right, okay. So it's about so the first hundred and something thousand dollars of income uh, is uh, charged a payroll tax, which is typically split between a, an employee share and an employer share. Or if you're self-employed, you pay the whole thing. Obviously, that split between employer and employee is itself kind of fake because it mostly sort of ends up being passed on. Uh, but that's sort of but that's how it's how we account for it. Uh, and so, uh, in order to make Social Security solvent for the next 75 years, which is sort of the, the long run horizon, at which point we don't even think about it anymore, we would need to raise an additional 3.4% of all payroll over that period of time. Uh, according to the trustees. And so there's a bunch of different plans uh, to, to extend the life of, of the Social Security Trust Fund. Um, if you look at the Congressional Budget Office, uh, uh, they've got a, a whole suite of options that you can go and look at. But I think the one that we should talk about most is is raising the payroll tax cap, right? So basically um, uncapping uh, income there, right? So the and the one of the prevailing uh, ways to do that is not actually to just say that all income over one hundred and forty seven or one hundred sixty thousand dollars would be taxed, but instead to say, well, we're going to keep the, that cap at one hundred and fifty or one hundred and sixty. But then we're going to start taxing income over two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. And the thinking there is that 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 will make sure that only people who are making more than two hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year, i.e., the rich in political parlance, uh, are subject to the the new um, to the new tax. Uh, and if you do that, the Congressional Budget Office reports that there's going to be some economic effects. If, if that happens, because what happens if you start taxing all of that money um, a, a lot higher than you're taxing it right now? Uh, one thing that happens is people earn less uh, f per extra dollar that they earn over $250,000. And so that just means they're making less, period, even if they're making the same amount of money pre-tax, right? So if you were making $300,000 or, or whatever that is uh, per year, you're going to be earning less, even if there's no other change. But because people are because each marginal dollar is worth less... The Congressional Budget Office also says that people will, on average, work less because people will be somewhat less motivated to work uh, because the, just because working is, is worth less for them. And so there are economic effects and there are, there is an economic drag to 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 taking a path like that and to increasing taxes, um, even if you do end up sort of making the, the Social Security Trust Fund somewhat more solvent uh, for the next several decades as a result. Uh, let's talk more about uh, taxes and drag, Nick. Um, back uh, when uh, Ron DeSantis uh, you... entered the chat. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Meatball Ron just entered the chat. Uh, uh, back in your uh, carefree youth, uh, Nick, 
uh, yeah. when you were doing a lot of uh, uh, drag uh, and taxes. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, sure. You man. wrote a great piece with Veronique Derugy with the headline, The 19% Solution, which pointed out that the historical size or share uh, let's say, of um, how much the federal government was gobbling from GDP was around 19%. We deviated above that 10 years yeah. ago, and you guys sounded the warning that that would uh, threaten to create both political instability and drag on the economy. So where are we now with those numbers? Uh, how will the uh, short-term victory of uh, Joe Biden's autopilot yeah. uh, affect the ratio? And what what will the, might those side effects look like? So, uh, according to the CBO, between 1972 and 2021, so this comes up to last year and, and includes two massive years of COVID spending, outlays by the government average 20.8% of GDP average. Uh, revenue was 17.3%. It's estimating for the next 10 years, outlays will be 23.2% and revenue will be 18.1%. So essentially, we have just we are looking at spending substantially more uh, money as a percentage as as a, a ratio of the economy than we ever have in peacetime. Uh, there was a spike during World War II where spending per GDP uh, as a percentage of GDP reached forty percent, but um, you know where this is uncharted territory, <clears throat> where we're going to have you know massive persistent completely unrestrained spending. We might well have record revenue coming in, but the annual deficits and the national debt will just continue to grow. At the same time, more people as a percentage of the population will be above 65, so they'll be collecting Medicare and Social Security, uh, probably working less. Um, so, you know, this is, it's a really, really bad situation um, and the worst part of it, and, you know, Matt, just to push back a little bit on you talking about uh, Joe Biden, I mean, it's it's important that the Republicans all leapt to their cloven hooves to <laughs> applaud the idea that they are not going to cut old age entitlements. Absolutely. Uh, whatsoever. And so like what Peter's talking about, all of that spending so secure, on things like Social Security and Medicare are just going to take up more and more resources. Um, and, you know, that is it's not going to be a productive uh, decade looking forward. Uh, the other thing that I'll throw in for Social Security, and I have a short video op ed that'll be coming out in a couple of days about this. But according, you know, you can find different studies that find different things, but all of them come. All of them basically agree that if you take that 12.4 percent of uh, income that gets taxed, the payroll tax that goes into Social Security, uh, in 2016, the Tax Foundation uh, did a study where that worked out to about twenty or twenty-one thousand dollars a year for the average. So, an average worker paying into Social Security would get about twenty-one thousand dollars a year from that. And if they had put ten percent of their income into a conservative, typical IRA uh, or four hundred one k plan that was split between a sixty percent stocks, forty percent bonds, they would have gotten three times that. And virtually every analysis of Social Security shows that it is a generally weak output uh, for you know for people, particularly even average workers. Um, so it's you know we're we're doing everything we can to sustain a system that was passed in 1935, started cutting checks in 1940, in a radically different economy, in a radically different world, when people were living shorter lives and old people to be old was to be poor. We are, um, you know, it, it's mind boggling. And I mean, it's, you know, I think a lot about how Jar Jar Binks was a senator in Star Wars. And like, you know, when you look at the State of the Union, it's Jar Jar Binks in filling every seat there. They might have different predilections and, and stupid focuses, but they're all idiots. Misa not going to cut Social Security? Yeah, no. I was all about all. ready to congratulate Peter for not taking the bait. And you just took it. Um, gonna revoke that. Congratulations, Captain. Do Speaking not of congratulate. Hubs. Do not congratulate. <laughs> uh, Catherine, um, what are your least favorite parts of the Biden MAGA populist convergence, as expressed, especially uh, at the State of the Union last week? 
And there were so many parts. I think, you know, we talked about some of them in advance, just the the increasing convergence in terms of um, the willingness to use federal power to manipulate all kinds of commercial transactions. And um, the sort of junk fees stuff was uh, a great example of that. Just um, classic, classic populism, right? Just like taking kind of harnessing people's anger at a at a, you know, a thing that was just not the president of the United States business, like resort fees for crying out loud and uh, and rallying people around that. But I do think, you know, what we saw at the State of the Union was just a bunch of people realizing for the first time a thing that those of us who have been watching this question for a long time already knew, which was that no one wants to cut Social Security or reform it in any way. And I, I guess it makes sense to me that there was still a widespread belief that there were two sides to this issue. And, the, you know, the fact that Joe Biden managed to get on TV that there is there is only one side that everyone agrees that they're going to do nothing as long as humanly possible is, you know, it had that it had that ring of like, yeah, man, duh, to those of us who have been watching. But I, I get it that other people thought maybe Republicans were going to try and solve this problem and whether they thought it was a good thing or a bad thing to solve it by, quote unquote, sunsetting, which is also an amazing like it's such a perfectly crafted term for people to misunderstand. Like when the sun sets, it goes away, Matt. It's gone forever. That's how the yeah. sun works. Or something. like I, I don't understand. <laughs> like, um, it's a technical term about you know that that people crafting legislation use. It does not mean the same thing as permanently abolishing or defunding or eliminating Social Security. And everyone involved know that knew that Joe Biden most of all, and he exploited that confusion and misunderstanding. Misa worried As great matter- fireball will never come back. Stop. I will kill you. Yeah, that is uh, just knife him. That's too uh, much. The as a matter of fact, as you mentioned that, Catherine, it reminded me that Jimmy Carter's 1979 speech, which I wrote about last week, it's kind of the uh, uh, timeline analog to Biden's speech uh, in terms of where he was at in his first term. He comes out in favor by name of sunsetting programs. We need to uh, stop the regulatory, you know, beast from just fattening forever, and we need to like figure out what's going on uh, and uh, and such that these things. And I don't think that he's portrayed as a monster. Um, well, Peter, and to be clear, uh, history's am, greatest monster. Well, that's true. To that's be clear, true. I'm pro. I'm pro yeah. sunset, both pro actual sunsets yeah, yeah. and pro the now routine sunsetting is, of yeah. legislation. Like that would be a perfectly good mechanism to keep these policies in check to routinely review them for whether they still fit the world that we live in. It's just, it's not, it's not what actually happens. It's not what actually works and it isn't going to happen. I, I want to point out Matt, because this meme, I forget exactly how it entered my timelines, but uh, over the weekend it was heavily there, which is that, and I'm paraphrasing it, but that Jimmy Carter speech is closer to Pearl Harbor than it is to today. Yes. And, uh, you know, it it is just amazing that people are not talking about the actual transformation of old age entitlements into something that is targeted and helps poor people, regardless of age. But let's just say, okay, old people, you know, because they've lived through a lot of shit, they get special benefits just for being 65. Like, I mean, it it is just, it's mind numbing. Um, and one of the things that Jimmy Carter was, you know, bitching and moaning about was that Ronald Reagan was going to destroy the, uh, uh, you know, uh, Social Security because it was part of FDR's New Deal. And Ronald Reagan left office touting, and this is actually, I believe, in the 17, uh, 19% solution story that you referenced earlier. But Ronald Reagan said that his greatest achievement as president was securing funding for Social Security and Medicare for the next generation, which worked out to be about true. Towards the end of his presidency, he jacked up payroll taxes. That was part of a big uh, tax package uh, right at the end of his thing. And it's like, he, goddamn him for that, because he used to be, he used to be critical of, uh, of mandatory social security. Peter, uh, Catherine mentioned that she kind of understands, you know, uh, people being surprised that to learn that uh, there are Republicans jumping up and down on their cloven hooves. Uh, applauding the not touching um, wearing social- Ric Flair style clothing. By the yes. way, I loved Marjorie Taylor Greene's rolled fur coat. 
she I mean, explained she that must she must have gotten it from she was dressed up as the balloon yeah is, it was her <laughs> balloon costume <laughs> <laughs> we're in a pretty good place uh politically is, is what i'm trying to say fine. but uh yeah uh, Peter, um, so uh, again, <laughs> Catherine said that uh, that it was sort of understandable that people would be surprised to learn that Republicans actually are not in this day and age all that interested in holding the debt ceiling hostage over cuts in Social Security and Medicare. OK, so let's 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 give people um, a, a slight break on this. But how many Damn political journalists and commentators, including people who you forward in the Slack every damn day, um, have, were out there in September and October and November of 2022 saying the midterms, the biggest story before the midterms is that Republicans are totally going to hold uh, the economy hostage to force Social Security cuts. Total bullshit at the time, total bullshit now. Um, and these are people who were supposed to be sophisticated ob observers. What do we make of that? Well, I think you wrote about this, and I think part of what we make about it is that Democrats, as in people who are at like actual elected officials, but also their boosters in media, Democrat aligned uh, journalists, uh, pundits, want this to be the Republican position. And they want it to be the Republican position because they view it as uh, ben politically beneficial to Democrats. That's why Joe Biden did what he did at the State of the Union is because he believes it to be politically beneficial. And frankly, if that were true, it would be correct. And to the extent that people believe that it is true, it is correct. Like, I, I just I, I agree with the short term political calculus that what that Democrats want to demagogue this issue and they think that doing so is good politics for them. And I like just on the on the it, getting people to vote for the merits. I think the, the answer is pretty clear. People are going to vote against Republicans uh, for this. But Mitch McConnell has been saying we're not going to do that. And the and the the Rick Scott plan, which is the the sort of the the source material for the Democratic argument that this is the big thing that that um, that Republicans want to do, that, that 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 is not something that Republicans stand by at all. I mean, there was a quote just within the last week in USA Today from Mitch McConnell, uh, who is, you know, the top Republican in the Senate. Unfortunately, that was the Scott plan. That's not a Republican plan. <laughs> Rick Scott is, to be clear, a Republican senator. But this is this is what Republicans are doing now is distancing themselves from any effort to make any kind of meaningful changes to entitlements, despite the fact that, as I have said many times uh, in about six years or so, one of the big Medicare trust funds is going to be insolvent. And in 10 or 12 years, Social Security's big trust fund is going to be insolvent as well. And somebody's going to at some point have to step up and do something. And I think that that's something that is going to be done is not something that anyone on this podcast is going to report approve of. It's going to be uh, sort of tax increases and uh, budget gimmicks, some combination of the two, possibly some very token spending cuts, you know, stuff that is essentially trivial that doesn't really matter. And that's what's going to happen. And it's going to extend the life of Social Security and or Medicare for a, at least a, a decade or two. They're going to kick the can down the road and that's going to be that. And I think that that's the way the politics are shaping up. And I think that that's, you know, sort of uh, the, you're, the question is about is about the sort of the lefty journalists who are political analysts who are trying to say that Republicans are just desperate to cut entitlements. I think you could say that you, that was more true in an era when Paul Ryan was a very prominent Republican and when Paul Ryan was a, you know, was a one of the, the Republican leaders. But it's just not true anymore. Republicans under in the in the Mitch McConnell and Donald Trump era have basically given that up. And that was one of the lessons that Republicans took from the Trump presidency is you have to say we will never cut Social Security and we will never cut Medicare. Those things are totally off limits. They're the third rail of American politics. Uh, Nick, uh, I know you have special fondness for yeah. uh, the uh, Republican backbencher chorus of thumbs downing, crazy costume uh, nuttiness. What what do you make of that? I mean, we're so it's uh, Joe Wilson. You lie was 2009 and it was like a big deal at the time. And like, wow, he broke decorum and he apologized. And there was a there was a, a vote against him, like cen censuring him. Um, and like, we're just not there anymore. What, the, what, what do you think about this sort of Republican uh, 
uh, worldwide uh, wrestling federation thing that's going on right now. Yeah, I, I think it uh, is unfortunate because it's if if the lack of decorum, uh, you know, was was motivated by a need to make things better, that would be one thing. But it really is. I think it's just reflective of incredibly like double digit IQs among people like Marjorie Taylor Greene and Lauren Boebert. Uh, and Marjorie Taylor Greene has emerged as like a leader of the Republican Party, at least rhetorically, because there aren't any legislative leaders. I mean, somebody like Kevin McCarthy, you know, to call him an empty suit is really to diminish, you know, the the way suits look on mannequins. I mean, they're kind of nice. I mean, he just is terrible. Mitch McConnell may be as, uh, you know, as as kind of brain dead as Donald Trump or the older Republicans at this point. I don't know. I mean, but it's a party that is either is both on autopilot and then has a bunch of really stupid nihilists uh, involved. And again, I, I think Mitch McConnell know, decorum, is tactically savvy and a, and a reasonably intelligent political operator. Uh, he was, but his whole he, uh, yeah, actually, MO uh, is he just go. wants Republicans to, to fill seats. He wants to. It's entirely about short term electoral ca calculus. And there's right. almost That's no. That's how you get someone dressed as right. a balloon in and one of your yeah, seats. And, yes. And there's almost no uh, actual but, sort of legislative or, or yeah. policy initiative. There's no principle other than, yes. you know, uh, but where I think uh, his mental capacity and his political uh, talents have diminished is that uh, this should have been a big year for the Republicans, including in the Senate. And he was not able to manage the candidate selection and the, you know, the races that would have helped do that in a way that I think he has done in previous uh, moments and things like that. But, you know, your point is taken. I mean, this is not, you know, Mitch, you know, the, the Republican Party doesn't stand for anything, even rhetorically anymore. And that is, you know, one of the great takeaways of Trump is that he came in and was like, okay, you guys are the party of limited government. You're the party of maybe immigration on some level, maybe free trade, uh, you know, and maybe actually interventionist foreign policy. And he's like, well, you're not that anymore. I've, you know, I've changed that. And I really do think that the younger Republicans in the House who seem to have some energy are just really nihilistic. They don't care about policy. They are not serious about anything. And all they like is trolling. And that's, you know, a party filled with Marjorie Taylor Greens um, is not going to be an effective counterbalance to the status quo. And that, you know, in the end, like I don't, I'm not particularly anti-Republican more than I am anti-Democrat, but this, you know, and this, this, uh, this kind of uh, dualism has flipped or this equation has flipped at various points. But when you have, you know, you have two major parties and when one of them is not putting up a good coherent fight, the status quo, you know, maintains itself and it grows a little bit more and more. And that's one of the reasons why we're going to have, you know, 23% of GDP spending for the next decade, uh, because there's no way to, to bring that back. Catherine, to close out uh, the segment, uh, let's uh, fling some poo in the democratic uh, direction uh, as well. Is there a, a nihilism or a sort of a magical thinking ism um, that is sort of on the increase of kind of a modern man, uh, mo modern monetary theory? I can never figure out that stupid acronym. Um, let's just write a big check and, and have the trillion dollar coin. Um, but looking at uh, social security, we used to have Barack Obama saying that he's not going to kick the can down the road on his watch. And now just like no one on the Democratic side is doing this. Uh, Criticized Democrats, Catherine. Delighted to. I, I will say the people I felt the most uh, kinship with by far in the in the room during the State of the Union was that sort of somber faced seated block of the Supreme Court and like the Joint Chiefs down there. Like every time everybody <laughs> like started getting up and shouting and yelling and there was just like the the like stillness of that section. I was like, yes, this is me. Like we have like fight, flight or freeze. And I am just absolutely like with team freeze at this point. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that the, the variant of nihilism that you see in the Democratic Party and Democratic leadership right now is they recognize that there's kind of a big sales pitch in being anti-capitalist. And um, and I think it's not a coincidence that some of Joe Biden's most interestingly awkward moments, both in the speech itself and then he's done some tweets afterward, is where he has said, I'm a capitalist, but we got to take all the money from everyone who earned their money in the market. Um, that 
that's out of fashion. You know, he it sat awkwardly, I think, with what we understand of the kind of progressive elements of the Democratic Party, who are the parallels to the Marjorie Taylor Greens, um, who would never say I'm a capitalist, but um, or would say like something more like, well, we live in a capitalist system. That's just the reality. You know, they sort of they could acknowledge it, but not be in favor of it. And um, I think we're going to see a lot more of that. I think we're going to see the Democratic Party claiming to be anti-capitalist or at least elements claiming to be anti-capitalist while absolutely doing nothing to substantially change the system that we exist in because it's a good one that benefits them and they know that and politically it wouldn't actually be expedient to undermine it. It's the same as these Republicans who are like, well, I'm for small government, but um, and they sort of start skipping that first part eventually. And that's where we are now. So I think, yes, there's there's an equal kind of emptiness in terms of broad based, like large vision policy goals on the part of both parties. And, you know, the, the other thing I thought was like during Biden's speech, you know, if you were looking at the prepared text while he was talking, the places he ad libbed, he repeatedly ad libbed variants of I know this proposal isn't really popular with anyone, but like in several places, um, because his proposals aren't really popular with anyone. Like he's right about that. Um, that was not sort of the right t- move tonally for a state of the union, but they're not even that popular with his own party. And he knows it. And he's kind of trying to hedge that. Um, and then the little Social Security kerfuffle was just a surprise that fell into his lap. There was a funny bit of legislative trolling in the House a couple of weeks ago before the State of the Union when House Republicans held a vote to uh, on a, a a bill that like wouldn't do anything but denounced socialism in all its forms basically just to see how many republic uh, how many democrats would vote uh, for and against it and uh, uh, 86 voted 86 democrats voted against denouncing socialism in all its forms and 14 voted present that's really the kind of uh, work that i'm uh, just makes me proud to be an american all right remember uh send your uh, to the point email uh, queries to roundtable at reason.com this one comes from frequent correspondent Leonard Goodnight, if that is his real name, he writes, we hear a lot in libertarian circles that prohibition doesn't work as a rationale for ending the drug war, legalizing abortion, prostitution, etc. Generally, I think that's correct in principle, but there's a problem with that logic. It works too well. Prohibition also doesn't work when the thing being prohibited is murder, rape, robbery, or arson. Shouldn't those be illegal? Where do you draw the line between prohibition doesn't work, so we shouldn't have this law and Prohibition doesn't work, but we still have to have this law. Catherine? I think the distinction between those two categories is how broad based the consensus is about which about whether the thing should be illegal. Um, So when I think about prohibitions and, and particularly when reason uses that term, we very, very often use it to mean laws that are at odds with the culture or with a substantial part of the culture. Um, Everybody agrees murder should be illegal, though we disagree on the edges of what exactly murder is and whether the murder I want to do today specifically should be illegal sometimes. But that is a very different matter than, say, abortion, um, which I've written about. One of the big, big problems with making abortion illegal is that people live side by side. You know, their neighbors disagree about this question. And when that happens, People will see it as morally right to oppose the law, to violate it or to support others who want to violate it um, in a way that I don't think is generally considered true for these kind of very basic thou shalt not kill type rules. That's an imperfect metric, of course, right? Um, There are different times in history when everyone agreed that slavery should be legal. We all agree. So no problemo here. Obviously, there was, in fact, still a problemo there. But that, I think, is the useful distinction, sort of when asking this question, you know, will a prohibition of this kind succeed or fail? A lot of it hinges on, are you fighting a cultural status quo or are you operating in an op- in an environment where there is really deeply held substantial disagreement? Those are the prohibitions that fail. Nick, uh, more to add? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's also the question of the the type of activity we're talking about. Murder is bad because it takes away somebody's right to life, uh, you know, liberty, and I, I assume the pursuit of happiness. 
uh, drinking or doing certain types of drugs as opposed to other types of intoxicants doesn't. It's you know voluntary behavior, uh, freely chosen by consenting adults. And when you start to ban those types of activities, those are the things that are going to persist in a big way. Um, you know, murder is a rare phenomenon, and most crimes uh, against people's rights and property are relatively infrequent. Something like drinking uh, is not. Or, or drug taking and things like that. Um, and, you know, any law when it's passed needs to be, uh, you know, uh, per uh, Catherine's uh, kind of comments, you know, it needs to go through some kind of cost benefit analysis because it could be a right, moral and proper law. And if it's going to become a disaster, once it's implemented, you got to really kind of think about different ways of, of restraining that type of behavior. But with these other kind of prohibitions, I don't, I don't, you know, I think the whole category needs to be rethought. You shouldn't be trying to keep people from doing behaviors that, uh, you know, they have every kind of moral right in a free society to participate in. Peter, more? Uh, I basically agree with Nick. That's the right distinction. Are are you taking away somebody else's life, somebody else's freedom, somebody else's property? If so, then it's okay to prohibit it, even if that prohibition does not fully eliminate the uh, activity. And in fact, I think that the, I, the, the one thing I would sort of really add here is I sometimes think that it's at least a little bit of a, an error for libertarians to say prohibition didn't work period, with no caveats. Because in fact, the best evidence we have is that prohibition did re reduce drinking by something like 30 to 40 percent in the country. It obviously had an effect on alcohol consumption. Now, it also had a bunch of terrible side effects and un unintended consequences. Uh, it, 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 it turned alcohol into a black market that was uh, that was uh, a vector for a huge amount of crime and violence um, and just sort of, uh, you know, black market, bad black market activity. It degraded the quality of drinks, not just in a way that was like less artful, but that was also literally dangerous to the people that was consuming them. So it made drinking more dangerous. It also uh, it also tended to reduce drinking most amongst people who were already light, casual, non problem drinkers. And so it drove problem drinkers into ever more, ever and even more dangerous drinking situations. And that's the kind of thing that prohibitions on personal behaviors that may, in some cases, have some social negatives. I mean, I mean, I would say, like, we have to acknowledge the existence of problem drinkers, of problem gamblers, people who have personal issues with those things. But the way to solve those uh, problems is not by prohib by prohibiting them, by making them illegal and throwing people in jail. The way to solve those problems is by treating those issues individually uh, and as you know, sort of as as, uh, as personal problems rather than uh, by making them crimes. And so I don't know that I like that this the sort of the the phrasing prohibition doesn't work. I think prohibition doesn't work as intended. Uh, prohibition has terrible uh, unintended consequences and is ultimately worse for society is a better way of thinking about the problems with prohibition. Doesn't fit on a bumper sticker, Peter. Uh, all right, let's go quickly to a. I should probably a huge say new... I have pr almost certainly at some point in my life said prohibition doesn't work. I say it all the time. Uh, There's a, a big uh, uh, Urban Institute study last week. Didn't get a lot of attention. Um, got some. A study on public school enrollment declines. The author Thomas D has been doing some of the best work out there. I think he's in Stanford on a pandemic era bleeding from K through 12 enrollment. Basic uh, takeaway is that over the two main school years of the pandemic, so beginning in the fall of 2019 and ending in June 2022, public K-12 through enrollment did not bounce back as advertised. It declined by around 1%. Meanwhile, to the extent that we have the numbers and the report is kind of uh, measures different things there, uh, private school enrollment was up 4% just in the last school year and homeschooling was up 30%. In last school year. And most weirdly, and this is what uh, attracted most of the headlines, we don't know where about 400,000 kids are that uh, dropped out of the system. It's not explained by going to new forms of schooling or just by the shrinkage of the overall school age population. Catherine, you follow this stuff pretty closely. What did you find particularly interesting or noteworthy about the study? I mean, the the scale, the the size of the numbers surprised me somewhat. Um, I think it was entirely predictable that if you say to a bunch of um, especially older kids, you know, high school age kids and very, very young kids, so um, kindergarten age, if you say to their families, 
school is absolutely required. You must go. And then also say we won't be providing school services for a couple of years. You're going to lose a bunch of people out of the system. They're going to say absolutely not to hell with this. And uh, as in the case of the central anecdote um, in one of the articles that spun out of that study, they're going to go get a job at Chipotle because that's a much better use of their time than trying to do some kind of janky online schooling that nobody put any thought or effort into. I can't even say I blame the Chipotle defectors, frankly. Um, the thing that's interesting to me, Great punk band name. the Chipotle defectors, um, yeah. the thing that's interesting all going to, Taco Bell. to me is, you know, of course, these students, of course, these people are findable. Like no one is easier to find than an American 17 year old. I guarantee you that every single one of these hundreds of thousands of missing students have a TikTok presence, have, you know, a, a thousand ways that you could find them online. Um, it just to me, it really is just like one more blow to the myth that the thing that public schooling is doing is somehow creating a common cultural basis and shared basis of knowledge for American students. It is not. There are so many ways in which people are not participating in this system for perfectly good reasons. And this just brought all that to the fore. It pushed another batch of kids out of the system. But it's th this has always been true. It has always been true that like even if the kids' bodies were in the building, they were not consuming anything substantively that was like making them into good American citizens and voters. They were just getting through it. And now that's not even that. And it's just it's just absurd to me that people can still straight facedly say that the public education system in the United States is like a worthy one that we should fund more. Peter, um, we've been criticizing Republicans a lot on this podcast for uh, not really having much in the way of policies. But Sarah Huckabee Sanders, a governor of Arkansas, I believe. Um, she gave the response, uh, spate, State of the Union, spate of the Union address. Um, and uh, uh, in between various culture war stuff, she talked basically about education. Um, and she is one of the many governors, most of them Republican, um, who are kind of leading with their chin on on aggressive school choice. Is that not a Republican um, like signature issue in this age? Yes, I think that Republican governors uh, have an opportunity to actually make a difference here. Republican governors, unlike Republican senators, actually have real responsibilities to voters who are going to make the decision about whether to pull the lever for a Republican or Democrat uh, who's going to be in charge of their state, who's going to be the chief executive. Um, for the for their state. And so they're going to be responsive uh, there and they're going to just make you know, they're going to be engaged in the business of governing at least somewhat more than, say, Marjorie Taylor Greene or Rick Scott. Um, uh, and I, I think that Democrats handed them this opportunity. And it's really interesting that uh, if you in some ways, if you think about it, Republicans right now are acting as defenders of the public school system um, and Democrats and teachers unions who have positioned themselves sort of uh, that way, at least by, by in terms of messaging um, over the last you know decades have uh, throughout the pandemic. Um, Teachers unions contributed to what is what we are now seeing as the meltdown and breakdown of public schooling, school closures, especially the longest closures in blue states and blue cities were driven heavily, not exclusively, but heavily by teachers unions. And the result is that people are just opting out of public school entirely, not opting into sort of other kind of quasi publicly funded things, your backpack, but no, just opting out entirely. And that is going to cause huge problems for the for the teachers unions that wanted to stay home for a year or two because of the pandemic. Nick, uh, other things to add about the study or about the politics surrounding it? Uh, you know, one thing that's interesting to me, uh, because I went to Catholic school, but Catholic schools, which, uh, you know, circa 1960, I think that was their peak year in the country, uh, they have been losing people at the same or a faster rate than uh, public schools, traditional public schools. And they actually lost lots of kids during the pandemic. Uh, in the first year, they actually had a, a bigger loss than uh, than conventional public schools, and they haven't really bounced back fully. So 
that is to me is kind of interesting because Catholic schools traditionally are low um, are low cost private schools. But if you go back to 1960, the number of kids who are in private schools has not really changed very much. It's still stuck around 10 percent. Uh, what it where the action is is in alternatives to conventional public schools. Some of that is homeschooling where the numbers are still kind of small, but the growth of publicly financed charters. Um, so I think that's actually one of the places to go, and they tend to be less unionized or not unionized at all. Um, and then the other thing, Matt, I think that's worth keeping in mind is not to path. I I don't know the right phraseology of this. Not to pathologize the COVID lockdowns as the thing that changed everything, because when you look at school districts like New York and especially Los Angeles Unified School District, which is the second largest district in the country, they have been losing people, losing students for decades um, because they suck. And that, you know, the COVID uh, experiences has accelerated certain things, but it's you know there. This is a long, slow decline, which is kind of similar to when we were talking about old age entitlements. This, these are you know kind of systemic, slow moving you know arteriosclerosis type problems in American politics today. And it's not clear. I'm not as sanguine as I used to be, and even as more states have passed backpack funding, where you know in every state in the country, education is either the single largest or second largest uh, line item in a, in a state budget. So when, govern when things change at the state level and money that the state was going to be sending to a local school district goes to a kid's parents instead, it's a big deal. Um, but I don't know, I don't know how much, you know, like the, the teachers unions kind of like old age entitlements and, and, and conventional schools, they are in it for the long haul. It is really hard to ultimately find that place where, you know, there's a tipping point and actual like serious systemic reform is going to take place. The, uh, in New York, the uptake, uh, of, uh, available, uh, parents or families to participate in the system, went from about 67% in the late 90s to about 75% um, under uh, Mayor Bloomberg, who uh, a lot of that is charter school, uh, public charter schools that uh, brought people back into the system. And then it started uh, uh, tanking again. So it was uh, a lot of the long decline was uh, just in terms of population. But in terms of percentage of the population, um, they had shown uh, increases from the dark old days of the 80s and 90s. Uh, but that is now um, uh, accelerating. There's a big Empire Center um, report on that um, derived from the Thomas D study um, to talk about uh, the just uh, uh, absolute uh, and yes, pandemic related uh, acceleration over the last uh, couple of years of exit out of New York. But a lot of that too is that people with families just left the city because it's why stay for a variety of different reasons, work related and otherwise. All right. Um, at Nick Gillespie's insistence, correct insistence, I might add, we're making time for a lightning round of um, yesterday was a, a Super Bowl. Big deal in America. The biggest televised spectacle of the dang year, the Kansas City Chiefs, as Catherine well knows, mm. uh, beat the uh, <laughs> uh, be, beat the uh, San Diego Pitchers. Was my favorite uh, name of a of a non-existent. Um, you you go around like Europe or Asia. There's always people with like bogus. It's uh, like a Chat GPT uh, prompt uh, teams uh, there. Uh, no, they they beat the uh, Philadelphia Eagles, um, 38-35. Mm. Very exciting. And so let's do a lightning round, beginning with Catherine and her ladies' book club. Of your very favorite thing about the Super Bowl yesterday. I like the Ben Affleck Duncan commercial, and <laughs> I will not be taking questions about that. Um, yeah, I mean, I've enjoyed the arc of Ben Affleck, which like now just encompasses, I think, a certain generational despair, um, which I enjoy <laughs> a lot. And um, the tidbit that I learned about that commercial is that apparently a bunch of the customers at that particular Dunkies were just absolutely furious that the service wasn't that great that day like that, oh, that's the, like great. they were they they greeted being served by Ben Affleck exclusively with uh as one write up put it invective flecked outbursts which is a, a try to say that three times fast yeah i i that's all i'm here for i'm here for like despairing ben affleck serving me donkeys and like just super casual rihanna like she was just like she was marking the steps she was walking through. 
low energy, screw you. She was chill. She was just like, yeah, I'm Rihanna. I'm pregnant and I'm playing the Super Bowl. What do you want? I'm amazing. You're welcome that I'm here. And I think we should all bring that energy into 2023. <laughs> uh, Nick, you'll agree with me that that was no Dunkachino uh, performance by Ben Affleck. Yeah, but, no, uh, no, that's for sure. Uh, what yeah. was your favorite part of the uh, spectacle yesterday? Well, I, I'll start with my the biggest disappointment. I was pregnancy and all. I thought that Rihanna was going to uh, disrobe to some kind of you know creative uh, effect. Yeah, her and coat so just I'm still got bigger. By that, like I know. Her fame, it, it was, like her I, I found I I am not here for low energy halftime shows. Uh, you know, and I one of the things I went back. Uh, it was only really in the uh, 90s that Super Bowl halftime shows became like big, big things. The <laughs> and, 90s was a long uh, time you know, ago. Yeah, it's for uh, the 90s are closer to Pearl Harbor <laughs> yes. than we are. Yes. I mean, like everything is closer to Pearl Harbor. And you're starting, I'm starting to think like maybe, you know, we need Pearl Harbor to generate more activity. But like <laughs> Pete Fountain, the jazz player. Oh, you know, God. Like he. He appeared at the Grambling State University marching band have appeared at, like they they were appearing in halftime shows into the 90s. And it's just like, what the hell is going on? Like, uh, you know, it, the, the halftime show, I like last year's, which got trashed because it was seen as like a Gen X oh, uh, sellout. And it was fantastic, you know, so I, I didn't like that. Uh, what I want to come for is I had to end up watching the end of the game on ESPN Gamecast. Uh, which is a uh, they've had it for years. I just it it's kind of like an old eighty style uh, handheld video game. It's like watching that, and I loved you know the last minute or two on Gamecast where you get these slow moving diagrammatic updates of what happened, and it's so exciting to watch a game that was as close as that one on Gamecast and know that you know it's like the light from a dying star in a different galaxy, you know you're receiving it long after everybody involved is dead. Uh, it was really great. So uh, that's what I liked about that, the Super Bowl. Uh, is uh, beautiful and poetical. Uh, Peter, what was your favorite uh, moment? Uh, uh, William's sister selling uh, whiskey ads? I didn't watch it. Yeah. <laughs> but since Nick brings moment. up uh, Pearl yeah. Harbor, I just want to say <laughs> oh, no. that yeah. it's, it's- I hate this transition for us. <laughs> It is Michael Bay's worst movie, and to bring this full circle, kind of peak Ben Affleck in a certain way. Yeah. Mm. I think what Affleck we saw was in... yesterday was peak Ben Affleck. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, no. I think he was also in a commercial for uh, the uh, the 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 making or how Nike landed the Air Jordan. Um, there's a Ben Affleck picture coming up Bad. at that time. Yes. I think it's true as long as we're talking about about Ben Affleck is from this point forward, he's going to be known as somebody, uh, he's going to be known as a Matt Welch impersonator. That's right. Rather than the other way around. Thank if, you uh, for recognizing I hope my achievement. I hope you'll put that story in today's show notes where <laughs> I'll see. Matt Welch tried out to be a uh, Ben Affleck impersonator. I was recruited, kind of sir. Um, okay. Uh, my favorite part of the Super Bowl uh, uh, part of, you know, uh, ongoing middle-aged sogginess, uh, was, um, uh, as it went from like the pregame show to the, the, whatever the, the they called it the, uh, the pre kickoff portion of the, of the programming. Uh, they had, uh, some, uh, voiceover of Johnny Cash narrating a poem about the tattered flag um and uh and it, 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 all this footage and just like well she's she's gone through a lot this kind of stuff and there's like the that whole section and then just going through like baby face for some reason playing a guitar left-handed america the beautiful wow with like 75 chord changes key changes uh and then it goes to chris uh, stapleton um, playing great version, absolutely great version on electric guitar of uh, and singing of the national anthem, causing the Philadelphia Eagles head coach 
oh, I forget, Giovanna Rabisi or something, whatever his name is, just, just ugly cry. <laughs> He's just like bawling on the sidelines while this, this fat country dude is just warbling out wonderfully. <laughs> uh, I loved all. And then then a red, a flyover of a uh, lady, air, <laughs> lady <laughs> uh, air, uh, Navy pilot gals. Uh, just I loved every little bit of the Americana over the top schmaltz at the beginning. I'm here for that. I'm disappointed that up with people didn't participate or that the Chinese air balloons didn't fly over. That would have been nice. There was a children's chorus, I should say, who were also like, well, the Johnny yeah. Johnny Cash was talking about. She she's looking okay. Then they like they panned the the kids chorus, uh, doing ums and ahs. Love it. Uh, ten out of ten, no notes. Uh, all right, uh, let's go to what other culture we have been consuming out there in the world. Nick, why don't you start us off? Uh, okay, so I read, and now I need to find it again. Uh, the a fantastic new book by Verlin Lewis and Hiram Lewis. I don't know what the relation is, but they are two separate people, separate but equal. Uh, the, it was called "The Myth of Left and Right: How the Political Spectrum Misleads and Harms America." Matt Welch, mm -hmm. I want to remind you of a book oh, that Jesus. was published about a decade ago, maybe 12 mm -hmm. years ago, called The Declaration of Independence. This brings the receipts that we, uh, you know, failed to uh, You left, like, expense. stuffed in the bottom of your wallet. Yeah, expense. You know, the, that book <laughs> yeah, was we, closer uh, then, to know, Michael Bay's Pearl Harbor yeah. <laughs> than we are to it that is. book. I, uh, or to Pearl Harbor itself. Uh but it is um, the myth of left and right, how the political spectrum misleads and harms America it is a fantastic uh, book of political science. And it is these guys are not pushing a libertarian alternative to things. But when they talk about how people who call themselves conservative or liberal, right or left, Republican or Democrat, attempt to essentialize these categories and it is. Uh, it is something that needs to be read and understood by everybody in a political journalism uh, kind of enterprise, uh, because this clarifies so much about why our political discourse is just rancid and useless and obfuscatory. Um, the one thing that I will add, and this is uh, having had several uh, conversations with Jonathan Haidt, what is interesting is when you look at the you know political spectrum or political tribes uh, from a political point of view as opposed to a psychological view you get different readings and what height and other people uh, somebody like Karen Stenner who used to be at Princeton and wrote a book called the authoritarian dynamic uh, years ago will talk about is that you know psychologically there are certain types of people who kind of are going to be have certain types of uh, temperaments or predilections that get expressed in certain types of political outlooks like conservative and liberal and things like that or libertarian and authoritarian. Um, and that's important. And that's an essential part of understanding politics. But the myth of left and right, how the political spectrum misleads and harms America by Verlin Lewis and Hiram Lewis really explains the politics of the current moment and why the two parties don't seem to be particularly different from one another, but act as if they are absolutely, you know, uh, you know, the devil versus angels or something like that. Really good book. Peter, what did you uh, consume? So I watched Magic Mike's Last Dance, the third film in the Magic Mike franchise. And, you know, it's a, it's a movie about male strippers and middle-aged female empowerment and six-pack abs. But as it turns out, it's also a movie about zoning and historical review boards and why they're bad. And I, I wasn't expecting that. I really wasn't at all, though. Maybe I should have been because this movie, like the first one, it, uh, is directed by Steven Soderbergh, who is one of the great observers of, uh, of, of modern life and one of the great movie directors of the last 30 years or so, in part because whatever budget level he is working at, he always manages to find some way to to add in some sort of uh, frisson of reality, right? Like his movies seem, even, even at their most ridiculous, always seem to take place in something like a real and recognizable world with real and recognizable characters. And I want to be clear, this is a completely re absurd and completely ridiculous movie. 
but it has a lot of small, sharply observed little bits in it, in particular the way that uh, historical preservation review boards are basically used as political tools by powerful people to stop stuff that they don't like that other people are doing, not to actually preserve historical things in, in a way that like makes any kind of sense. And so this is a movie about a uh, a wealthy older woman who hires a stripper to, to conduct a male dance review at the, um, the the historical theater that her husband kind of owns, but she has become um, uh, the, the she she now runs as part of a kind of divorce type settlements. And she's like, this is a, this is a way of getting revenge on her husband and tr and trying to make him mad. And so what he does is he uses his political connections, including going up to like MPs in the British uh, Parliament to try and stop this thing from happening, not by like, you know, making a big moral issue about it, but by saying at one point that the stripper stage that they built was three quarters of an inch too high and therefore they're going to have to shut down the whole thing. And it's actually that's that is how a lot of zoning and like sort of historical review stuff works. It's not really about the preservation of the of the neighborhood character or something important. It's about somebody is mad that somebody else is trying to do something that is interesting and innovative, and they're using their political connections to get it shut down. It's not exactly a great movie, um, but it's fun and uh, and better than I expected. And again, just really sort of sharply and amusingly observed. And, Ch and Channing Tatum is a genuinely charming dude uh, at, at all times. Listening to Peter, I talk. loved uh, Soderbergh's first movie, "Sex Lies and Zoning Boards." <laughs> yep, <laughs> it's a classic, which came out, I think, closer um, to <laughs> Pearl Harbor. Uh, Absolutely. <laughs> listening to Magic Mike Three, a uh, reference to it, um, is kind of like you know, like if you follow New York Post on Twitter, which is the world's uh, greatest newspaper, or at least America's. Um, <laughs> there, it's always like uh, you know, this celebrity just dunked on that celebrity about having an affair with this celebrity, and you've just recognize absolutely nobody in the story at all. It feels really great. The fact that there's this is the third in the Magic Mike trilogy. Like, okay, that's great. I, I've checked out of whatever this is. Um, oh no, now the Magic Mike. I, I Peter, I uh, appreciate your review because I'm I'm a big Magic Mike fan, and uh, you know that way the Magic Mike franchise, Matt was instrumental in reviving Matthew McConaughey. Uh, you know, it's also so, a great it's... portrait of kind of of crappy Tampa and the and the the weirdness yeah. of the Tampa economy where you've got all these guys who are like, well, I'm sort of a stripper, but I also do construction and maybe I'm trying to start a furniture store. And it's just it's a great movie about like a, a an under uh, a, a place that doesn't get a lot of attention in Hollywood. And it actually seems like to, to have taken an interest in the people there again. Soderbergh is is a sharp observer of real humans and their real lives. There's a great little bit where like one of the characters is like, I'm a Medicaid insurance administrator or something like that. And it's just like, oh, those are the types of jobs people actually have in Tampa. And you don't see that in a lot uh, of films. Catherine, what do you got? I have a sports ball. Uh, that is not the Super Bowl. Um, I want to recommend to people. I've talked about it before, maybe. Um, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's Substack. That's what I'm recommending to you. Uh, Yo, you're so mad. You're so bad. I'm mad at him because he yeah. is my nemesis. He beats me every year for the Los Angeles Press Club Columnist of the Year Award. Every year. Every single mm. year he beats me. It's fine. Um, because of that, I took an interest in LeBron James's uh, beating of his NBA scoring record. If I can't do it, at least LeBron can do it for me. And um, went to read the uh, fairly substantial piece that Kareem Abdul-Jabbar wrote on his Substack about having his record broken. And once again, infuriatingly, it is absolutely gentlemanly, charming, gracious, thoughtfully written, and um, I hate it. So uh, I recommend to you Kareem Abdul-Jabbar Substack. He says in the subsection, why I'm thrilled that LeBron broke the record. Whenever a sports record is broken, including mine, it's time for celebration. It means that someone has pushed the boundaries of what we thought possible to a whole new level. And when one person climbs higher than the last person, we all feel like we are capable of being more. Ugh, he's right. And it's cool to celebrate human accomplishment. Fine. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, yeah. a gentleman, a scholar, a victor, even in defeat. 
he also brushes back Magic Johnson a little bit. In he that, does. He I, says uh, he's but he's like, again, so gracious. He's like, my friend, we have been friends for so long. If he said anything, I would believe him. He is unfortunately slightly mistaken in re- with regard to whether or not I am mad about this record being broken. And that's totally fair because had it been broken it some years ago, I would have been hyper competitive and angry about it and probably done something crappy. But now I'm 75 and I have wisdom. And so I have moved beyond these petty grievances it's it's good matt i know i read it it's very good um i just want to register my surprise that neither catherine on her current uh religion journey nor nick on whatever journey he's been taking (laughs) uh mentioned the two uh some of the greatest super bowl ads there were is about jesus 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 had some good commercials during the super bowl uh go check it out i'm just uh, i'll leave it at that i did um, i did oh. baptist this weekend by the way with uh jason russell our esteemed managing editor uh the cool baptist as he described them and they were indeed cool. Yeah. props to the cool baptists of clarendon uh, <laughs> again band names up and down uh what i saw and i saw sitting next to nick gillespie it was uncharacteristically mm-hmm. quiet um, during this. He only is checking his phone sometimes. And uh, not asleep. Uh, and not asleep. Yeah, yeah, usually there's yeah, a little yeah. so, s- snarkling yeah. sound uh, yeah. when you sit next to Nick at a, a movie theater. We saw uh, a fantastic movie called yeah. Pinball, The Man Who Saved the Game. Yes. Um, and it's by the Bragg brothers who work for reason, Meredith. And mm-hmm. Austin Bragg, I wouldn't just say that because they work with them. Uh, I would say, if anything, there it, are Matt uh, Damon and Ben Affleck. Uh, very much so. Uh, it is the story of Roger Sharp, who is the spectacularly mustachioed uh, GQ journalist uh, and pinball player, um, or the, the would be GQ. Or I guess he ended up ha- having a pretty decent career, but he helped uh, overturn New York City's ridiculous. And are you kidding me? They really had this uh, 35 year ban on pinball. Uh, in uh, 1976. And it's just sort of the story about how that happened. And it's also a love story. And it also has the single greatest, and I hope they win an Oscar just for this, cinematic deployment of a Badfinger song in the history of uh, of film. Um, it is, uh, it's terrific. It's just really funny and warm spirited. And I, uh, I just uh, can't say enough about it. It's the beginning, it's a theatrical release sometime soon. It's on the festival circuit and doing very well. We, there was a special uh, screening that we watched in Manhattan and just great. And uh, go check it out. Pinballfilm.com uh, is the place where you can go and find out more information about it. But it's just really funny and nice. Yeah, it'll be uh, coming to video on demand in March 17th, Matt Welch. Okay, that's great. Um, all right. So. Thank you for listening to this slightly longer version of uh, the Reason Roundtable podcast. Uh, check out all our podcasts at reason.com slash podcasts. Uh, Nick, anything coming up in New York City that you would like to invite people to after your spectacular triumph last week with Kat Rosenfield? Uh, on March 9th, uh, we will be having a Reason Speakeasy Thursday, March 9th with Anthony Scaramucci. Oh, well. Uh, we'll be talking about why this is going to be the greatest year ever for uh, Bitcoin and other forms of cryptocurrency as well as uh, talking some trash about a uh, a Queens uh, real estate developer who once uh, led a little country called America. That uh, is very exciting. Okay, thank you for listening. We'll catch you next week. Goodbye.